Hello family members, hope you're having a good day today. Today we're going to talk about Harry Potter and J.K. Rowling and the unique relationship between the two of them. Uh, J.K. Rowling is an author, if you're unaware, and Harry Potter is the series that made her famous. And she not only is the writer of the initial books, but also a lot of paratextual information and a whole different uh, plethora of ways of, of being presented. You know, she wrote a lot of like backstory on her website, wrote some like really short, <laughs> like um, faux textbooks, um, wrote a uh, stage play or like made up the story for a stage play. I mean, there's a lot that she's added to the franchise since she finished the last book um, and continues to to add in a lot of ways. And that in a way is somewhat unique, but she takes it one step further where in a lot of ways she acts like she is part of the franchise herself. And in fact, maybe even the most important part of the franchise in a lot of ways. And it, it just seems to me that she, she takes a very um, territorial approach to, to the, the stories and the success of the stories. And, and very much owns it for herself. And that's not something that all authors really do. The Harry Potter fandom is one of the most extensive fandoms that's ever existed. Now, it's changed a lot in the last years since J.K. Rowling has come out and, and confirmed that she is, in fact, a transphobic bigot. But um, even now, if you go on like fanfiction.net and you check, you know, the number of stories per franchise, Harry Potter has an insanely large, I mean, a disproportionately large <laughs> population of, of fan fiction that's been written and all sorts of fan works that have been created. In a lot of ways, the Harry Potter franchise has been treated by fans as a jumping off point, uh, as a you know place where you start sort of the bare bones framework, and then you can sort of build the vision of it that you have brick by brick. And I was thinking about that uh, the other day when I was watching um, a four hour long video about the worst Harry Potter characters uh, by a, a YouTuber called uh, Carolyn Eason, I think is, is that her name? Um, I'll, I'll link the video below. Um, but when she was talking about like certain characters and she has another video where she talks about like the female characters in Harry Potter too, specifically. Those are the two videos of hers that I've watched, so I can't speak to her other content. Both of them were, were quite interesting. And, and I realized that a lot of the characterization that I think of with some of the side characters on Harry Potter really didn't come from J.K. Rowling. It really came from fanon, you know, fan interpretations. And that kind of got me thinking because there's this concept called death of the author and it's really complicated, but to simplify it, it's sort of like separating the art from the artist, saying that the authorial intent isn't as important as the way that people interpret the work. Um, so in that sort of concept, once an author writes a story, and puts it out in the world, it's no longer their story. It's the world's story. And the world gets to decide what to make of it from there. And the author can't go back and, 
you know, retroactively change the story because it's already been sent out to the public. <laughs> and obviously J.K. Rowling does not believe in that at all. You know, we know that. Uh, where she goes back and tries to retroactively add more diversity to the books, talking about how she likes the idea of Hermione being black, which a lot of people have already pointed out that that's really messed up considering the whole slavery thing. But if you haven't read the books, you might not know that. Uh, there's a natural slave race and Hermione fights to save them. And people look down on her and say she's just being a nosy busy busybody. Can you imagine if she were black and they treated her like that? Whew, it would have been. Anyway, um, you know, and also trying to say, oh, D Dumbledore's gay, but we're never actually going to put that in any of the actual, you know, direct text of the franchise. But, it, you know, uh, he he's gay. That's why he didn't have a wife. Doesn't have kids because he's a weird gay guy. <laughs> I don't know, but it's just, mm. anyway, uh, she could have written the books to include that diversity, but she didn't. And uh, somebody came up with the idea later on that that should be the case, or, you know, she had this vague idea in her head that Dumbledore, maybe he's gay or whatever. If it's not in the books, it doesn't really matter, right? But she expects it to. And for a long time, the fans kind of went along with it. And I don't know if it would have ever really been questioned by the fandom at large if she hadn't, you know, openly decided to support uh, transphobic bigotry. Um, you know, say, hey, there's this transphobic activist that um, wants to start a political party and... and has some very extreme views, I'm going to offer to pay for any legal fees she has. I mean, she's very direct in her support of transphobia. And so a lot of people were like, okay, what do I do with this? What do I do with a franchise that I love that has this author attached to it that's very vocally bigoted and has said very publicly that she believes that people continuing to buy merchandise and, you know, licensed games and go to theme parks and buy books and movies and all of that, she believes that that is a validation of her bigoted beliefs, that people believe that what she's saying is right and they're supporting her when they buy the series or anything related to the series. And... So, you know, it became a, a fairly common thing within the post-fandom <laughs> for people who previously were fans to decide that they just had to step away from the franchise. That, you know, for, you know, maybe moral reasons, maybe it just didn't feel fun any, anymore to them knowing all this uh, for whatever reason. And... It's interesting to me because my my thoughts on this were formed by the uh, Lindsay Ellis video on this, on the J.K. Rowling and Death of the Author. And, and she pointed out that the franchise is uniquely tied to her. And that you can, you can separate the art from the artist in a lot of cases, but it's difficult to do this in this case because she has enmeshed herself and made herself part of the work, at least in her own mind. Um, I was watching something the other day, or a while back actually, it was about um, when JK Rowling decided to pick on a small YouTuber, a small American YouTuber and, and call them, call her out by name and kind of sick her mob on her and basically, you know, was like, well, you can't like anything that's my stuff if you're uh, against me because, uh, I, you know, blah, blah, blah. And the things that she thought were hers were interesting. 
You know, she sees things, the symbols that are associated with Harry Potter as hers. She sees owls as hers. She sees, you know, all of the Wizarding World stuff as hers and things associated with as hers. And I find that very funny because that's not true. And if she believes that she owns Harry Potter, well, she's not really right about that. She can't. She gave it to the world and the world owns Harry Potter. And she's just sort of decided that she's as much of the part of the franchise, maybe more so, than Harry himself. She's made herself, or tried to at least, the leader of the fandom. And you just don't often see other creators doing that, you know, where they, they make their whole identity rest on their authorship and their ownership of a beloved franchise. And honestly, at this point, the way I feel about it is that if you show that you're a Harry Potter fan, you know, if you have like Harry Potter iconography anywhere, that people are going to assume that you might be hostile to trans people or queer people in general. Whether or not any of us like it, because J.K. Rowling has made both Harry Potter and uh, anti-trans bigotry her two most important identifiers, she has intrinsically linked the two which is kind of strange because Harry Potter isn't necessarily transphobic. I mean, it is trans exclusionary. I don't see any sort of trans people in the story, but it isn't actively transphobic. But if you see someone wearing a Harry Potter shirt and you're out in public and you're visibly trans, you might be nervous that that person might be hostile to you because of their endorsement of iconography that has become, unfortunately, intrinsically linked to transphobic bigotry. And it, that isn't something that, that should be. But it's just a practical reality at this point that that she has, has inserted herself and defined herself in a lot of ways by the authorship of this series. Now, Harry Potter, honestly, uh, conceptually never made much sense. Um, if you think about the timeline, numbers, poverty, any number of the things that, that any of the details that make up this series just fundamentally don't make sense. And so the story itself, I always kind of saw it more as a framework, as an idea, as a place to springboard off of. And, and I think that's why the fandom is so active it's because there's so much there. Harry Potter as a character is a little bit uh, ill-defined. He's sort of broad and, you know, in a lot of ways probably so that readers can kind of project themselves onto him to a certain extent. And so that leaves a lot of room for very interesting interpretations of his character uh, after the books um, or during or before <laughs> or, you know, a lot of the different various side characters. The one thing that I think that J.K. Rowling is really good at is 
coming up with this complex web of characters and locations. And they don't necessarily all make sense or all fit together, but it's a, a good enough framework for people to build on. And, and so I have read fan works, fan fictions that I am certain a lot more time and energy and care and research went into creating them than anything that J.K. Rowling will ever write. Because she's lazy. She's extremely lazy when it comes to, like, any culture that's not something that she natively knows she is very uncurious about learning about it. And if she decides to depict it in her books, she has no like, uh, no um, compunction about making it completely inaccurate because she just doesn't care one way or the other. Good enough is good enough for her, you know? Uh, for example, all of the other wizarding schools that she made up. I mean, one wizarding school in all of South America, all of North America. But, you know, you got Durmstrang and Hogwarts at least. Oh, and, and uh, Bow Batten's in Europe. Europe's just got way more witches and wizards for some reason. The, the Japanese wizarding school is the smallest school. Why? Japan has a lot of people. <laughs> That's one thing Japan has a ton of. People and islands. Okay, it doesn't make sense. And the lore behind the, the various international wizarding schools doesn't make much sense either. You know, uh, anything that's outside of her natural wheelhouse, you know, she doesn't know much about it and doesn't care to. And I think that's why she doesn't understand how unique her relationship with her works are you know there are other authors um who are fairly prominent say like a stephen king or whatnot he has not made his whole life be mostly revolving around one series that he did one idea that he came up with many years ago for a children's book <laughs> and and honestly not a very complicated one and honestly the other thing about Harry Potter that just kills me is that she clearly didn't know where she was going you know she didn't plan ahead so but she wants to make her whole life about this one thing because it's gratifying to her because people loved it because at first the fandom bought into her, you know, projected, you know, kindly, progressive-ish demeanor. And the, the thing that we realize now is that she's just not rabidly conservative, but she's still, like, pretty centrist. She's not progressive. And... That's something that, that, honestly, the Harry Potter books make pretty clear. Um, when I was reading them, um, you know, I was, I think, probably in college, late high school, college. I was old enough reading them that I was very well aware that the stories didn't fully make sense. The world didn't fully make sense, but that it was sort of a metaphor for the longing for nostalgia, for her longing for the way that things were when she was growing up. You kind of know that, you know, uh, because of the timelines, you know, it makes a lot more sense when you think about it if Harry was her age instead of the age that he actually is. Um, um, and. Like, I mean, from like a perspective of how the world works. Um, for example, what were the wizards doing when the internet was uh, being put together? 
did none of them, Mongol-born wizards coming in that knew anything about the internet, say, hey, maybe we can do something better than this owl telecommunication system? <laughs> well, it's not telecommunications, just communications, I guess. But, you know, it, it's very clear if you think about it too much, if you scratch too much, that the story was always pretty paper thin. But that's not a, necessarily a terrible thing, especially, you know, when you're talking about fantasy and, and children's fantasy. Sometimes things can be a little thin. They can be a little uh, simplified or, you know, not really make sense or not really have to work that way because it's about the story. But I think in the end, Harry Potter isn't about the story. It is about the setting. That's what it is. It's a love letter to the way that J.K. Rowling grew up with some magical touches added into it. And it probably feels very personal to her because of that. But everyone reading those books didn't necessarily get that connection the way that I did especially if they first read them when they were kids. And I think that's why it's easy for a lot of people to disconnect her from the work because in a lot of ways they don't, they don't see it that way. They see Hogwarts and that place in the way that they saw it as they were reading it growing up instead of the way that she sees it and saw it as she was writing it. And with this complicated relationship, we see people kind of expecting the way that she is and, and identifying her with the franchise, the way that she, the, you know, how enmeshed she became with the franchise, they kind of see that and apply that to other authors and other works as well. And I think that kind of ruins storytelling in a way because a story can be good and can bring hope to people and comfort and joy, even if that person is not a great person. I think that we do better when we separate art from artists. But J.K. Rowling doesn't understand that. And she's raised a lot of kids to not understand that as well. And so we see, you know, people kind of obsessing over other authors uh, or creators because they kind of expect them to be as you know, involved in the fandom as J.K. Rowling wants to be in, involved in hers. Um, for example, um, uh, there was a show called Supernatural. I never watched it, but it, it was really big in fandom. And I know that during that run, while that show was on, people would often want to talk to the actors about the characters and their interpretation of the characters. And not all of the actors were comfortable with that. And, and I, I think that's because that's not something that we always expected. But we do now in this world where we've had JK rolling on Twitter and we can interact with her and had her you know, anoint herself queen of the fandom and essentially create a whole bunch of fan works herself. You know, I mean, of course, because she wrote them, they're officially part of the franchise and she can make money off of them, but they're not often uh, things I think she thought about ahead of time. There are things that she added as sort of metatextual uh, information that she thought would be enjoyable, you know? And so, 
I think that we forget, we often forget that her relationship with the franchise is is unique and that there aren't rules saying <laughs> that it has to be like this, you know. There's not precedent saying that it has to be like this, that this is unusual, that her her ownership in her mind of everything related to Harry Potter from fizzing whizbees to hippogriffs, you know, um, things she made up to things that she didn't make up but she just used in her stories. She believes they belong to her. And that if you're against her, then you're not allowed to enjoy any of the things that she believes are hers. And I find that very delusional in a way. <laughs> like, J.K. Rowling, you do not own owls. <laughs> you do not own the Harry Potter characters. You know, you, you may have named them and gave them vague descriptions, but I promise you, there are much richer versions of those characters out in the world that did not come from you. You know, that you may have provided that little kernel of inspiration, but somebody else took it and made it a whole new wonderful thing. But because of her misunderstanding that, because she believes very firmly that she owns these characters in this franchise, she has tainted it and ruined it for a lot of people. She says she doesn't care about her legacy. And that may be true. She's like, well, I'm going to be dead. What do I care? But the thing is, she already has tarnished her legacy. Like, she has already changed the, what the iconography of the sem of her beloved franchise means. She has already forever tainted it. There are people who will never go back to it, no matter what happens. Even if she were to die tomorrow and whoever owns the, like, estate decides to donate all further proceeds to charity, there are still people who would never go back. Even if it was a, you know, pro-queer charity. Because she has entwined the, the uh, concept of transphobic bigotry into her legacy so completely that it, and decided that Harry Potter is also so important a part of her legacy. Put those two things into her legacy and enmeshed them so deeply that they can never be intertwined, uh, unentwined. And there are still going to be people who aren't transphobic bigots that enjoy and, and engage with the Harry Potter franchise, and unfortunately, because again, you are validating J.K. Rowling when you do that, but there are going to be people who can never come back to this again. And that's because of the unique relationship that she's created between herself and the material. And that's something that, you know, only I think would have been possible in the social media era. And in the very online fandom era, you know. <laughs> and, and I hope it doesn't happen again. Because no matter how nice a person, good a person, any particular creator is, th their, their creations are not theirs. Th once you give a work of art to the world, it is now the world's. And People are infallible, or people are fallible, rather. 
but a great story, a great idea, that can live forever, you know? And it's kind of sad to see the framework for such a an, an interesting fandom be burned ashes because a billionaire needs to keep her cultural re relevance and is too rich and famous to ever have anyone check her and tell her, hey, maybe you don't want to be an open bigot. It's actually not good for any number of reasons, you know, even just from a being a, you know, compassionate human being perspective, you know, whether or not you care about what other people think about you or your work, you know. <laughs> so I hope we all remember that J.K. Rowling does not own owls <laughs> or Harry Potter or any of the iconography, and while I am going to continue to avoid uh, using any of the iconography in any way or supporting the franchise in any way, I'm also not going to give her the ownership she believes she is owed, at least in my own mind. And I guess that's the best I can do. <laughs> well, thank you very much, family members. If you made it this far, wow. <laughs> and uh, I, I hit 100 subs. It's, it's not a lot of subs, but to me it is. I've been building this channel for a long time. And, you know, I'm unable to sit up and film or stand and film physically anymore. I'm unable to, uh, you know, do the edited video essays with footnotes and stuff like I used to do that I, I wanted to really make. But I'm glad that I decided that if this is what the videos must be to get made, then that's all right. That I didn't stop myself from taking the time to share the ideas with, with y'all that, that uh, I have. And, um, you know, I, I believe that the idea is more important than the presentation. And I hope that at least some people will agree with me on that because this is what you get with me. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> but also thank you. <laughs> All right, family members, I hope you have a wonderful day and uh, I'll see you next time. Bye.